Welcome to the Mutual Audio Drama Network. The following audio drama is rated G for general audiences. Part 4 of The Children's Book of Christmas by J.C. Dyer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 4 Good King Wenceslaus. Good King Wenceslaus looked out on the feast of Stephen, when the snow lay round about, deep and crisp and even. Brightly shone the moon that night, though the frost was cruel, when a poor man came in sight, gathering winter fuel. Hither, page, and stand by me, if thou knowest telling it. Yonder peasant, who is he, where and what is dwelling? Sire, he lives a good league hence underneath the mountain, right against the forest fence by St. Agnes' fountain. Bring me flesh and bring me wine, bring me pine logs hither. Thou and I will see him dine when we bear him thither. Page and monarch forth they went, forth they went together, through the rude wind's wild lament and the bitter weather. Sire, the night is darker now, and the wind blows stronger. Fails my heart, I know not how, I can go no longer. Mark my footsteps, good my page, tread thou in them boldly. Thou shalt find the winter's rage, freeze thy blood less coldly. In his master's steps he trod, where the snow lay dented. Heat was in the very sod, which the saint had printed. Therefore, Christian men, be sure, wealth or rank possessing, ye who now will bless the poor, shall yourselves find blessing. A Mexican Mystery Sent by Bayard Taylor Against the wing wall of the Hacienda del Mayo, which occupied one end of the plaza, was raised a platform on which stood a table covered with a scarlet cloth. A rude bower of cane leaves on one end of the platform represented the manger of Bethlehem, while a cord stretched from its top across the plaza to a hole in the front of the church bore a large tinsel star suspended by a hole in its center. There was quite a crowd in the plaza, and very soon a procession appeared, coming up from the lower part of the village. The three kings took the lead. The virgin, mounted on an ass that gloried in a gilded saddle and rose besprinkled mane and tail, followed them, led by the angel. And several women, with curious masks of paper, brought up the rear. Two characters of the harlequin sort, one with a dog's head on his shoulders, and the other a bald headed friar with a huge hat hanging on his back, played all sorts of antics for the diversion of the crowd. After making the circuit of the plaza, the Virgin was taken to the platform and entered the manger. King Herod took his seat at the scarlet table with an attendant in blue coat and red sash, whom I took to be his prime minister. The three kings remained on their horses in front of the church. Between them and the platform, under the string on which the star was to slide, walked two men in long white robes and blue hoods with parchment folios in their hands. These were the wise men of the East, as one might readily know from their solemn hair, and the mysterious glances which they cast toward all quarters of the heavens. In a little while, a company of women on the platform, concealed behind a curtain, sang an angelic chorus to the tune of Opsicater de Londa. At the proper moment, the Magi turned toward the platform, following the star, to which a string was conveniently attached that it might be slid along the line. The three kings followed the star till it reached the manger. When they dismounted and inquired for the sovereign whom it had led them to visit, they were invited upon the platform and introduced to Herod as the only king. This did not seem to satisfy them, and after some conversation, they retired. By this time, the star had receded to the other end of the line and commenced moving again, they following. 
the angel called them into the manger where upon their knees they were shown a small wooden box supposed to contain the sacred infant they then retired and the star brought them back no more after this departure king herod declared himself greatly confused by what he had witnessed and was very much afraid this newly found king would weaken his power upon consultation with his prime minister the massacre of the innocents was decided upon as the only means of security the angel on hearing this gave warning to the virgin who quickly got down from the platform mounted her bespangled donkey and hurried off herod's prime minister directed all the children to be handed up for execution a boy in ragged zarape was caught and thrust forward the minister took him by the heels in spite of his kicking and held his head on the table the little brother and sister of the boy thinking he was really to be decapitated yelled at the top of their voices in an agony of terror which threw the crowd into a roar of laughter king herod brought down his sword with a whack on the table and the prime minister dipping his brush into a pot of white paint which stood before him made a flaring cross on the boy's face several other boys were caught and served likewise and finally the two harlequins whose kicks and struggles nearly shook down the platform the procession then went off up the hill followed by the whole population of the village breaking the pinata if you were in mexico the week before christmas you would not find one christmas tree unless it were in some town where americans had been living for a good while but everywhere children would be talking about breaking a pinata pronounced penate as you talk of having a tree in the small stalls set up in the plazas for the sale of christmas gifts there are hundreds of different gaily colored pinates some are bowl-shaped or oval jars made of the coarse red earthenware of puebla painted with dashes of yellow and black in patterns that have been copied from old indian pottery others are made of paper in gay stripes of red and yellow in shape like tissue paper balloons and are decorated with tinsel ornaments and streamers of bright colored paper such as are hung on christmas trees others still are made in the shape of grotesque figures clowns with baggy trousers dancing girls in widespread skirts monks in long cloaks and animals all of them jars or paper figures are easily breakable they are stuffed with sweets crackers rattles whistles or any other toys which are small and light and parents hang them usually on christmas eve from the ceiling of a room or from a branch of a tree in the courtyard each child of the family in turn after being blindfolded given a long stick and led some distance away from the hanging pinate is allowed to grope toward where he thinks it is and to strike out at it three times in the effort to break it if he fails another is given the chance mexican families are large and often a father and all his sons live together in square flat-roofed buildings of sun-dried brick round a common courtyard so there is a deal of laughter and excitement as one child after another makes his trial at last one manages to hit the pinate so that it breaks open and toys sweets and ornaments come down in a shower this is the moment for which the children crowding around have been waiting and they swoop down upon the dainties in a joyous scramble the successful child usually receives a special prize for blindfolded as he is he stands small chance of getting anything else breaking the pinate usually follows a curious ceremony in which all those present walk together around the house several times chanting a litany the procession is in memory of the night when joseph and mary journeyed to bethlehem and found no room in the inn often even the donkey belonging to the family is brought into the ceremony after the litany some go within the house while others outside sing a plea for admittance which is at first roughly refused 
Finally, they are admitted, and another hymn is followed by feasting and merrymaking, of which breaking the pinate is the children's part. Christmas upon a Greenland Iceberg One hot June day in 1869, there was a great stir in the new harbor of Bremerhaven in Germany. At its entrance lay two stout ships, the Germania and the Hansa, fully fitted out for Arctic exploration. Visitors and messengers were going back and forth. The King of Prussia himself, with many of his nobles, the Grand Duke of Mecklenburg, Schwerin, Count Bismarck, and General von Moltke, among them, had come from Berlin to say Godspeed to the commander and the scientific gentlemen who were braving unknown dangers and certain privations and hardships for the honor of the German Navy and of German science as his majesty expressed it the last of the cases of stores hoisted on board the hansa were stowed away with a peculiar laughing tenderness they were stout chests cased in lead in which friends of these explorers had placed such friendly little trifles as are inseparable from the celebration of christmas wherever the germans may be there is no place in this book for the story of their adventures in the slow voyage up beyond the ice line in july by some misunderstanding of signals the two ships separated never to meet again in september the hansa was caught in a great field of floating ice and was carried for two hundred days thereafter in the drift of the flow an october storm so racked the ship that her captain and crew were forced to abandon her and carry everything out upon the ice. The great coal bin of the ship was taken out and turned into a store hut. All the supplies were taken there, the ship's three boats were carefully secured, everything was taken from the Hansa which could be used for fuel, and at last the ship was cut away from the ice, lest in sinking she destroy them then again a frightful period of drifting storm after storm put them in danger of a sudden death which may have seemed more desirable than waiting for the winds and currents to carry them slowly into a warmer sea and toward the natural breaking up of the ice flow hope of rescue in those lonely waters was faint but they lived bravely and worked steadily constructing around the main hut from the timbers saved from the Hansa small black shelters in which all but buried in the snow the men lived, and that they kept Christmas in true German fashion, the log of the vessel tells. The tree was erected in the afternoon, while the greater part of the crew took a walk, and the lonely hut shone with wonderful brightness amid the snow. Christmas upon a Greenland iceberg the tree was artistically put together of firewood and raveled matweed hemp and dr laub had saved a twist of wax taper for the illumination chains of colored paper and newly baked cakes were not wanting and the men had made a knapsack and a revolver case as a present for the captain we opened the leaden chests of presents from Professor Hochstetter and the Geological Society and were much amused by their contents. Each man had a glass of port wine, and we then turned over the old newspapers, which we found in the chests, and drew lots for the presents, which consisted of small musical instruments such as fifes, juice harps, trumpets, etc., with draughts and other games, puppets, crackers, etc. In the evening we feasted on chocolate and gingerbread. We observed the day very quietly, wrote Dr. Laub in his diary. If this Christmas be the last we are to see, it was at least a cheerful one. But should a happy return home be decreed for us, the next will, we trust, be a far brighter. May God so grant. And he did but that is not a Christmas story, and you will have to look elsewhere for it. Luther's Christmas Carol for Children Good news from heaven the angels bring, glad tidings to the earth they sing. To us this day a child is given, to crown us with the joy of heaven. This is the Christ our Lord and God, who in all need shall aid afford. 
he will himself our saviour be from sin and sorrow set us free to us that blessedness he brings which from the father's bounty springs that in the heavenly realm we may with him enjoy eternal day all hail thou noble guest this morn whose love did not the sinner scorn in my distress thou camest to me what thanks shall i return to thee were earth a thousand times as fair beset with gold and jewels rare she yet were far too poor to be a narrow cradle lord for thee ah dearest jesus holy child make thee a bed soft undefiled within my heart that it may be a quiet chamber kept for thee praise god upon his heavenly throne who gave to us his only son for this his hosts on joyful wing a blessed new year of mercy sing the good knight in spain if you were a child in spain you would not be talking of christmas trees in the late december days but natividades or nativities these are tiny models of a scene supposed to be bethlehem some of them are very simple made of cardboard colored paper bits of stone and sand on one side is a hill built up of paper or plaster and in the side of it is the cave to which the gentle cattle were used to come for food and shelter by its crude matchwood manger stand or sit little figures of the holy family often these are modeled from beautiful designs the work of famous artists who put their highest skill into creating the tiny images of the mother and the holy child outside the cave stand the patient oxen and perhaps the donkey upon which the infant christ is to be carried out of the reach of herod overhead sparkles a shining star some of these simple nativities can be bought for a few cents others made of better materials or with greater care and with many figures are more costly these have besides the holy family perhaps a fire of ruddy tinfoil around which shepherds gather looking in their straight brown cloaks as if they might have stepped from your noah's ark and back of them on a hillside of green cloth little white wool lambs feed quietly in still another you may even see a smuggler with a slouch hat pulled down over his eyes hiding with a load of tobacco behind a paper rock to leave the road free for the three kings who in all their tinsel go journeying to worship the holy child the roads are rough with bits of cork the river is a strip of glass and the bridge over which the camels of the wise men pass is clearly of paper stone the rabbit hiding in the evergreens is quite as large as the donkey saddled for the flight into egypt but in the magic of the holy night all seems to be real to live and feel so natural and tender is the children's faith in these simple nativities which are repeated on a larger scale in all the churches on christmas eve or the good night as the spanish children say everyone must go to the church for the midnight mass and of course no one goes to bed before that early in the dusk the toy dealers bring their booths and flaming naphtha torches to the village plaza and the children swarm around them like flies to sweets all the week before groups of these children have been going from door to door at night singing to familiar tunes ballads which tell the story of the nativity and he is a poor spaniard who cannot find some small coins for the band of singers on holy night too after they have made the small round of the toy dealer's stands they go to each other's houses to look at the different nativities and sing one carol after another in which a single voice carries a verse remembered or made up at the time and the others join in the refrain while two of them dance at the end of each verse the two whose turn it has been to dance go up to the nativity with flushed cheeks and bright eyes open wide their little arms and fall on their knees with the exclamation for thee 
In some places, the children will instead carry a nativity into the plaza, singing carols in which everyone joins. One such carol is this lullaby. The baby child of Mary, now cradle he has none. His father is a carpenter, and he shall make him one. His father is a carpenter, and he shall make him one. The lady, good St. Anna, the Lord St. Joachim, they rock the baby's cradle, that sleep may come to him. They rock the baby's cradle, that sleep may come to him. Then sleep thou too, my baby, my little heart so dear. The Virgin is beside thee, the Son of God is near. The Virgin is beside thee, the Son of God is near. A Christmas Tree in Japan it was a huge Christmas tree, the first that had ever grown in our compound, for the children of our servants and writers and employees, who make up the number of our legation population, to close on two hundred. I could not have the tree on Christmas Day, owing to various engagements, so it was fixed for January 3, and was quite the most successful entertainment I ever gave. When I undertook it, I confess that I had no idea how many little ones belonged to the compound. I sent our good Ojita round to invite them all solemnly to come to Ichiban, number one, on the third at five o'clock. Ojita threw himself into the business with delighted goodwill, having five little people of his own to include in the invitation but all the servants were eager to help as soon as they knew we were preparing a treat for the children. That is work which would always appeal to Japanese of any age or class. No trouble is too great if it brings pleasure to the treasure flowers, as the babies are called. Some of them were not little, and these were more difficult to buy presents for. But after many cold hours passed in the different bazaars, it seemed to me that there must be something for everybody, although we had really spent very little money. The wares were so quaint and pretty that it was a pleasure to sort and handle them. There were work boxes in beautiful polished woods, with drawers fitting so perfectly that when you closed one, the compressed air at once shot out another. There were mirrors enclosed in charming embroidered cases, for where mirrors are mostly made of metal, people learn not to let them get scratched. There were dollies of every size, and dolls' houses, and furniture, kitchens, farmyards, rice-pounding machines, all made in the tiniest proportions, such as it seemed no human fingers could really have handled. For the elder boys, we bought books school boxes with every school requisite contained in a square the size of one's hand, and pen knives and scissors, which are greatly prized as being of foreign manufacture. For decorations, we had an abundant choice of materials. I got forests of willow branches decorated with artificial fruits, pink and white balls made of rice paste, which are threaded on the twigs, surprise shells of the same paste, too lightly stuck together in the form of a double scallop shell, and full of miniature toys. Kanzasi, or ornamental hairpins for the girls, made flowers of gold and silver among my dark pine branches, and I wasted precious minutes in opening and shutting these dainty roses. Buds, until you press a spring, when they open suddenly into a full-blown rose." but the most beautiful things on my tree were the icicles, which hung in scores from its somber foliage, catching rosy gleams of light from our lamps as we worked late into the night. These were chopsticks, long glass chopsticks, which I discovered in the bazaar, and I am sure Santa Claus himself could not have told them from icicles. Of course, every present must be labeled with a child's name, and here my troubles began. Ojita was told to bring out a correct list of names and ages, with some reference to the calling of the parents, for even here rank and precedence must be observed, or terrible heart-burnings might follow. The list came at last, and if it were not so long, I would send it to you complete, for it is a curiosity." Imagine such complicated titles as these. 
Minister second cook's girl, um, age two. Minister's servant's cousin, boy, aged eleven. Student's interpreter, teacher's girl. Vice Council's Jinriki man's boy. And so it went, till there were fifty-eight of them of all ages, from one up to nineteen years. Some of them, indeed, were less than a year old, and I was amused on the evening of the second at having the list brought back to me with this note. Ojita's English is still highly individual. Marked X is declined to the invitation. On looking down the column, I found that ominous-looking cross only against one name, that of Yasu, daughter of Ito Kanajiro, Mr. G's cook. This recalcitrant little person turned out to be six weeks old, an early age for parties even nowadays. Miss Yasu, having been born in November, was put down in the following January as two years old, after the puzzling Japanese fashion. Then I found that they would write boys as girls, girls as boys, grown-ups as babies, and so on. Even at the last moment, a doll had to be turned into a sword, a toy tea set into a workbox, a history of Europe into a rattle. But people who grow Christmas trees are prepared for such small contingencies, and no one knew anything about it when, on Friday afternoon, the great tree slowly glowed into a pyramid of light, and a long procession of little Japs was marshaled in, with great solemnity and many bows, till they stood a delighted, wide-eyed crowd round the beautiful, shining thing, the first Christmas tree any of them had ever seen. It was worth all the trouble to see the gasp of surprise and delight, the evident fear that the whole thing might be unreal and suddenly fade away. One little man of two fell flat on his back with amazement, tried to rise and have another look, and in so doing rolled over on his nose, where he lay quite silent till his relatives rescued him. Behind the children stood the mothers, quite as pleased as they, and with them one very old lady with a little child on her back. The children stood, the little ones in front and the taller ones behind, in a semicircle, and the many lights showed their bright faces and gorgeous costumes, for no one would be outdone by another in smartness. I fancy the poorer women had borrowed from richer neighbors, and the result was picturesque in the extreme. The older girls had their heads beautifully dressed with flowers and pins and rolls of scarlet crepe knotted in between the coils. Their dresses were pale green or blue, with bright linings and stiff silk obies, but the little ones were a blaze of scarlet, green, geranium pink, and orange, their long sleeves sweeping the ground, and the huge flower patterns on their garments making them look like live flowers as they moved about on the dark velvet carpet. When they had gazed their fill, they were called up to me one by one. Ojita addressed them all as Than, Miss or Mister, even if they could only toddle, and I gave them their serious presence with their names, written in Japanese and English, tied on with red ribbon, an attention which, as I was afterwards told, they appreciated greatly. It seemed to me that they never would end, their size varied from a wee mite who could not carry its own toys to a tall, handsome student of sixteen, or a gorgeous young lady in green and mauve crepe, and a head that must have taken the best part of the day to dress. In one thing they were all alike, their manners were perfect. There was no pushing or grasping, no glances of envy at what other children received, no false shyness in their sweet, happy way of expressing their thanks. I was puzzled by one thing about the children. Although we kept giving them sweets and oranges off the tree, every time I looked round the big circle all were empty-handed again, and it really seemed as if they must have swallowed the gifts, gold paper and ribbon and all. 
but at last I noticed that their square hanging sleeves began to have a strange lumpy appearance, like a conjurer's waistcoat just before he produces twenty-four bowls of live goldfish from his internal economy. And then I understood that the plunder was at once dropped into these great sleeves, so as to leave hands free for anything else that Okusama might think good to bestow. One little lady, Oharu-san, aged three, got so overloaded with goodies and toys that they kept rolling out of her sleeves, to the great delight of the brown ambassador dachshund Tip, who pounced on them like lightning, and was also convicted of nibbling at cakes on the lower branches of the tree. The bigger children would not take second editions of presents, and answered, Honorable thanks, I have if offered more than they thought their share. But babies are babies all the world over. When the distribution was finished at last, I got a Japanese gentleman to tell them the story of Christmas, the children's feast. And then they came up one by one to say, Sayonara, since it must be the Japanese farewell, and Arigato Gosimasu, the honorable thanks. Come back next year, I said, and then the last presents were given out, beautiful lanterns, red, lighted, and hung on what Ojita calls bamboos to light the guests home with. One tiny maiden refused to go and flung herself on the floor in a passion of weeping, saying that Okusama's house was too beautiful to leave, and she would stay with me always. Yes, she would. Only the sight of the lighted lantern, bobbing on a stick, twice as long as herself, persuaded her to return to her own home in the servants' quarters. I stood on the step, the same step where I had set the fireflies free one warm night last summer, and watched the little people scatter over the lawns and disappear into the dark shrubberies, their round red lights dancing and shifting as they went, just as if my fireflies had come back on red wings this time to light my little friends to bed footnote the english legation compound is the enclosure in which the official representatives of the english government in any japanese city live with their assistants families and servants end of part four Good morning! We hope you're enjoying Saturday's Story Circle. Got enough cereal? How's the coloring going? You can always join us tomorrow on Mutual with the Sunday Showcase. Original audio drama from the United Artists of Audio right here on Mutual. Subscribe to the full Mutual Audio Network feed for exciting audio drama every day. Or find the Sunday Showcase feed in your favorite podcast players. The Mutual Audio Network. Listening and imagining together.